Hello, friends and compounding community of FSHP. My name is Dianisi Savendano, Pharmacy Clinical Manager at Memorial Hospital Miramar and co-chair of the Pharmacy USP Compounding Committee at Memorial Healthcare. I had the privilege to serve as one of nine inaugural members of the Board of Pharmacy Specialties, BBS Council on Compounded Sterile Preparations, and I now serve as an active member of the Sterile Compounding Subcommittee for the Florida Board of Pharmacy. I want to thank FSHP for the opportunity to share my views on some important updates for the revised USP 797 and 800 chapters. It has been a very active year for the compounding community of pharmacists as we continue the journey to implement the latest revisions and best practices related to sterile compounding. I will attempt to highlight some of the updates and things you should probably know by now. If not, I suggest you start working on it right away as the safety of the patients we are responsible for is at stake. As you are probably aware, USP 800 was first released in December 2019 and became official July 1st, 2020. However, it wasn't until 797 became official that USP 800 also became compendially applicable. Since the last official publication of USP 797 in 2008, several proposed revisions have been released. The most controversial one in June of 2019 was halted and appealed on until its final release date in November of 2022. The latest versions of both 797 and 800 are official since November 1st, 2023. Some of you may not be too sure if USB 800 applies to you. I encourage you to review your pharmacy inventory and cross-reference it with the NIOSH list of hazardous drugs, last published in 2016. Many new drugs have been approved since then. Therefore, you must revise the monograph of any new drug that enters your shelves to see if it exhibits any of the NIOSH hazardous criteria. It is not only antineoplastics you should worry about. Drugs like megase, espinolactone, and warfarin are listed in the NIOSH list as well. USP 800 applies to any healthcare personnel handling hazardous drugs including receiving, storing, compounding, dispensing, administering, and disposing of them. Look closely at your practices to determine if you or those working under you could be at risk of developing reproductive issues such as infertility or miscarriage or more serious effects such as leukemia or other forms of cancer. USP 800 has allowed certain dosage forms to qualify for what is called an assessment of risk. These are a set of alternative containment strategies and work practices that could be implemented to minimize occupational exposure. Note that the AOR needs to be reviewed and documented annually. The revised USP 797 chapter is now organized into 21 sections with detailed explanations, requirements, musts, and shoulds. It applies to those compounding for human and animals. So yes, my veterinary friends must also review the requirements of the chapter. If you are docking bags and biosystems for future use or repackaging sterile products, this chapter also applies to you. If you will also be compounding hazardous drugs, you must then be compliant with USP 800. Those compounding radiopharmaceuticals cannot refer to a new chapter called USP 825. Preparing products according to manufacturer labeling instructions could also be out of scope if preparing for a single patient and the label contains specific instructions. Refer to the chapter for more information. The immediate use category changed drastically in this revision. We are no longer bound to puncture a sterile container only three times, and the administration can begin within four hours of preparation instead of just one. 
Keep in mind, training for a septic technique is still required if compounder under the media use category and the training must be documented in an SOP. In terms of training and competency, the chapter provides clarity and stratification of personnel, compounders, designated person, and personnel with direct oversight of compounders have different frequencies of competency and observation. The description and requirements for the designated person are also new in the chapter. This person is responsible for the overall compounding operations and has specialized training and expertise to be able to make changes and take decisions. Going back to training, the initial hand hygiene and garbing glove fingertip testing conducted at least three times before compounders are allowed to compound for patient use needs to be conducted and passed on a sequential basis. So if you fail the last attempt, you must start over. One of the most fundamental changes in the chapter is the replacement of low, medium, and high categories of compounding for what is now called category one, two, and three compounding. A segregated compounding area, or SCA, is used to compound only category one sterile hazardous and non-hazardous sterile products. Note that if used for compounding hazardous sterile products, it must have fixed walls, doors, and exhaust to the outside. A clean room suite with an anteroom and buffer room is needed to compound hazardous and non-hazardous category two and three CSPs. Note that the BUDs will depend on the category of compounding. Refer to USP 800 for additional facility requirements. Tables 13 and 14 of USP Chapter 797 will guide you on the maximum allowed beyond use dates based on the category of compounding. I have provided you with a summary table for guidance on assigning beyond use dates, but a lot more goes into determining BUDs especially if the products are aseptically processed or terminally sterilized. Please note that sterilization by filtration is not considered terminal sterilization in this chapter. Therefore, you may have to review your practices closely to determine the appropriate BUD. The choice of ISO class 5 air or primary engineering controls will be determined by the kind of products you will be compounding. Note that compounding aseptic isolators and compounding aseptic containment isolators are not considered isolators in the new chapter. These are now called RABs, or Restricted Access Barrier Systems, and we can no longer use any carbine gowning exceptions to compound. We must also place them in a clean room suite if we want to assign category two or three BUDs to our products. Keep in mind, a hazardous buffer room needs to maintain a tight pressure differential range between negative 0.010 and negative 0.030 inches of water column so that we don't draw too much air into the area and products can maintain sterility. The anti-area servicing a hazardous buffer room needs to be ISO class 7 air but if only servicing the non-hazardous sterile buffer room, then it can be ISO class eight, but must maintain at least 20 air changes per hour. Refer to the chapter for additional details. The chapter provides lots of boxes explaining how to conduct viable air samples and sulfur samples. Please note the action level for an ISO class eight environment became stricter and is set now at 50 CFUs per media instead of 100. The frequency of environmental sulfur sampling also change. What it used to be periodically is now monthly or weekly for category three compounding. If planning to conduct in-house sulfur sampling, you would most probably need two incubators, 
capable of keeping two different temperatures. Media needs to be supplemented with neutralizing agents. And remember to keep a copy of the certificate of analysis that justifies the media can grow both bacteria and fungi. Cleaning and disinfection steps are well explained in the chapter. If also compounding hazardous products, a deactivation decontamination step must precede the rest of the cleaning, disinfection, sporizado, and sterile alcohol applications. The chapter now requires the use of sporicidal applications and the frequency depends on the category of compounding and the area in which it is applied. Please note that any cleaner, disinfectant, or sporicidal used inside an ISO class 5 environment or inside a primary engineering control must be sterile. This review is just the tip of the iceberg. If not done so already, I strongly recommend you purchase the USP Compounding Compendium online subscription to be aware of any changes. I have included the web address in the presentation for you. The compendium is the source of truth, and in fact, 797 will undergo another minor revision, so the next official version will be May 1, 2024. Be sure to look online for what is changing. Last but not least, the Florida Department of Health and the Board of Pharmacy have released the updated 64B16-27-797 rule for the standards of practice for sterile compounding, which became effective November 16, 2023. The department inspectors will soon release a new updated inspection form aligned with the new changes of USP 797 and 800 revisions. But do not panic. If you are still struggling to become compliant, the board has allowed until November of 2025 before any disciplinary action is taken to those failing to meet the minimum quality standards for compounding sterile preparations. It is always a pleasure to inform you about the changes related to sterile compounding. As a compounder myself, I know firsthand the struggles to meet compliance and regulations while keeping the patient's best interest in mind. Good luck in the journey to implementation and thank you for moving the pharmacy profession forward. Until next time, Dianisis Avendano.